Okay, so we've talked about the utility that you get from doing one thing or the benefit that you get from doing one thing. So workers leads to airplanes or eating happiness or eating ice cream leads to increased um, utils or happiness. So that's just one thing that you're doing. Um, but you're never going to just consume um, ice cream and you're never going to have your final grade be determined by only hours of study. There are other inputs that you have. So if you have multiple inputs, um, the combination of those two things can create more utility. Um, and then this is what leads us into a discussion about trade-offs. Because sometimes it can be hard, it can be expensive to have like one product versus another product. And so you have to choose the right balance that makes you the happiest possible. And so that's why we care about this, this idea of utility. So to introduce this, there's this idea in economics called the utility bundle. When really it's just, it, it sounds all fancy, but it's just a combination of two things that gives you happiness. It's some theoretical combination of goods that provides the same level of utility. So we're going to introduce some math formulas here, but don't be too concerned about them. Um, this U just means this is a utility function. You feed it stuff and it spits out happiness. So that's what's happening here. Here we're saying X1 is some good, that could be ice cream. X2 is some other good, that could be pizza. So if you consume some number of ice creams and some number of pizzas, that's going to spit out some level of utility. That's all this is measuring here. So that's this utility bundle. You have a bunch of stuff that you're feeding into some formula that spits out happiness. And that formula can be whatever mathematical formula you want. So for instance, here's a simple one where it says your utility, if you have X1, let's assume that's ice cream, X2, let's assume that pe that's pizza, that's just going to be the number of ice creams you eat times the number of pizzas you eat. So if you eat three ice creams and two pizzas, then you're going to get three times two, six units of happiness. And that's the utility that you get from that combination there. Um, it doesn't always have to be this, this x1 times x2. It can be a whole bunch of other things. Um, it doesn't really matter. There's actually no way of measuring what this looks like in real life. That's just made up. Um, but it's OK, because you'll, you'll see in a minute, it's, we can work with these imaginary things. It's fine. Um, so to practice with this, let's say, um, assuming we're just multiplying the number of ice creams and the number of pizzas, or whatever goods we want to consider here, what would be the utility that we get if we do one of x1 and two of x2? So if you do the math, we're going to say one times two, which is two. Um, with this, we have 100 units of x1, so 100 slices of pizza or ice cream, 100 bowls of ice cream, and three pizzas. That's a lot of food. Um, if we do that, the utility we get, again, this says just multiply 100 times three. So that gets us 300 utils. Um, and then same thing with this, this other bundle here. If we say the utility of four of x1 and one of x2, that's going to be four because we're just multiplying them together. Again, that doesn't always have to be multiplicative. Um, you can have utility bundles that look like this. This is the one we just saw with x and y. You can do square root of x and y. Um, you'll often see this in textbooks because if you graph it, um, it actually like flattens out. Um, in a graph, which is good because that shows like diminishing marginal utility. Um, if you have something like X and Y, that's just going to go up and up and up forever. And so if you eat like a billion bowls of ice cream, you're going to get like a billion happiness points. Um, if you do the square root of X and Y, then that actually starts flattening out, which more like is more reflective of real life. Um, and in all of these situations, X and Y give the same utility. It's not like one is more important than the other. But that's not always the case. You can have a situation like this last one here, this X squared times Y. In this situation, X gives more utility than Y. So X, like if you eat two bowls of ice cream, that's going to give you two squared, so four units of happiness, times whatever, however many Y things you eat. And so that actually like that gives you a bigger number of happiness from whatever x is. Um, and so again, like, there's no way of finding these formulas from people's heads. This is impossible. It's all theoretical stuff. Um, but the reason we still deal with this is because you can measure some, you can measure people's preferences for things. And so if you have ice cream and pizza, you all don't equally like ice cream and pizza exactly the same. 
Some of you like ice cream more, some of you like pizza more, and that can be reflected in these formulas if you just square one of them or do something to make the other one smaller or less important. That works mathematically. Um, even if it's fake numbers, you can still get kind of the shape of preferences with these formulas here. So why this is important is because we can figure out the different combinations of these goods that create the same level of happiness. So if we have x1 and x2 here, again, let's pretend it's ice cream and pizza, which combinations of ice cream and pizza would create 12 units of happiness? Um, so think about that really quick in your head. How could we make it, like, what number of ice creams and pizzas could you eat that would create 12 units of happiness? So figure that out. And hopefully you figured it out. Um, you could do one ice cream and 12 pizzas. One times 12 is 12. Um, you could do two ice creams and six pizzas, because um, two times six is 12. You could do three ice creams and four pizzas. You could do four ice creams and three pizzas. You could do six ice creams and two pizzas. You could do 12 ice creams and one pizza. Um, so all of those combinations, the one and 12, two and six, three and four, four, three, et cetera, they will all create the same level of happiness. So if we plot it, um, here we have these different combinations. So there's our one of x1 and 12 of x2. Um, what that creates is this curve right here. Every point on this line here generates the same amount of happiness. If you can do partial pizzas and partial ice creams, um, if you did five of x2, that's right here, and like 2.4-ish of x1, that would give you 12 utils. Um, any point on this green line is going to give you exactly the same level of happiness, is what this is showing. And the official term for this in economics is an indifference curve, which means you are indifferent to the amount of goods that you're consuming at every one of these points. So if you were doing, um, like if you were here at 3, 4, or at 2, 6, that gives you some happiness, but you could also easily switch to like 6, 2 and be the same level of happy. Um, or switch to 3, 4 and be the same level of happy there. Um, it doesn't matter, you're still going to get 12 utils of happiness. And so that is an indifference curve. So in your book, um, if we go back to the example of Alexi here, um, he can have 15 hours of free time a day and get an 84 on his test, and that makes him some level of happiness, gives him some level of utility, however he wants to measure that. Um, so that's this point A here. That's some level of happiness. What we can do is we can create an indifference curve if we interview Alexi and say, how, like, if you want to be that same level of happiness, what would the trade-off between your grade and free time have to be to generate that same level of happiness? And he would say something like D here. So he's going to fail the class. He's going to have a 50% on his, on his final grade here, but he's also going to have 20 hours of free time a day, which is a lot of free time. And so that gives him happiness. And so this point D and this point A give him the same amount of happiness. Point E and F and G and H, all of those points there, even though it's different combinations of grades and free time, sometimes good grades, sometimes bad grades, but in, in exchange for more free time and less free time, all of those points here, if we draw a line connecting them, is it generates the same level of happiness. He's equally happy at point A as he is at point D, as he is at point G and E and F. All of those points gives him the same amount of happiness. Um, these other points, point B and C, he's going to be less happy down here at point B because um, he has less free time in the day and he's still getting kind of a high grade. If he wants to maximize his happiness, he shouldn't be down here. He should be up here at point A because he's going to get more happiness at that point. Um, same thing here at point C. He's going to totally fail the class, um, get like a 10% on his final grade and have 20 hours of free time a day. That's neat. But he could also have that same amount of free time and get 50 points on his final test. And again, that's not great, but he's a lot happier up here. So what ends up happening with these indifference curves 
is the further you go up in this direction here, the happier you are. And what we what we call that is having or being on a higher indifference curve. So as you move, if you're at this indifference curve B, if he could move up to this one that has A and E and F and stuff on it, that's going to bring him to a higher indifference curve, which is a higher level of utility, which means he's happier up in this world. He's not as happy down in this world. And so if you want to maximize your utility, if you want to be the happiest possible, you want to be on the curve that is as far up in this corner as possible. Um, if you're down here, you're sadder, basically is what, what this measures here. So these indifference curves, to summarize here, they're theoretical points. Again, they are totally made up, um, but they are points where we're equally happy with a mix of goods. So if we go back to here, he's equally happy with getting an 84 and having 15 hours of free time a day as he is getting a 50 and having 20 free hours of time or free or 20 free hours of of time per day that's the same amount of happiness for him however he measures happiness um, we measure this in something called utils um, that's the official term for it um, you can think about this as happiness points um, and the higher the curve is which again means the closer it is to this corner the more happiness points you get and the more utils you get and the better off you are so if you look on the course website for today, there's a video here that goes through a similar example that we just did, um, only instead of talking about ice cream and pizza, or yeah, ice cream and pizza, or free time and grade, it's talking about pizzas and coffee. Um, but it will walk you through the similar, a similar example to what we just did, showing how you can move up to a higher indifference curve and become happier and get more benefits. So I would recommend pausing this video going to the course website and watching this first video here um, to learn more about indifference curves and what they actually mean because it is a weird concept to wrap your head around um, but it's an important concept so i recommend go do that and then come back to this video so go do that okay i'm assuming you did that if not go do it um, so let's move on because we can talk about um, one more marginal rate of something here. So when we were talking about the budget lines um, or the feasible set is what we were talking about, the slope of that feasible set was what we called the marginal rate of transformation. We were transforming free time into points. We were transforming workers into airplanes. Um, the slope of the indifference curve, all of those indifference curves we have, is something called the marginal rate of substitution which is, again, it's a slopey thing. It's the, the change in um, grade that you get from um, giving up, or the, so in, in the case of Alexa here, it's the, the grade that you give up from moving from A to E. Um, so here, the marginal rate of substitution, moving from A to E, that slope right here is like nine. It means by giving up that extra hour, in this case, he's going to um, lose nine points of his grade, but get an extra hour of free time. Um, if you move to different places on this curve, that marginal rate of substitution is gonna be different. So up here, that's a nine. Down here, that's not gonna be nine. You're moving from, 19, from 20 to 19, and then 54 to 50, that's only a four point difference there. So the marginal rate of substitution at point H right here is only four. So those slopes are different there. So we keep talking about slopes and slopes are important because that's kind of central to all of economics. Um, when we're doing supply curves and demand curves and indifference curves and all of these things, what we're most interested in is the slope of these curves. Um, they're curvy, but they have different slopes depending on where you are on the curve and how steep those slopes are. So in order to talk about slopes, we need to quickly delve into the world of calculus but very 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 briefly and with resources that help you so you don't need to do any calculus by hand don't worry so let's go on to that section next